So, uh, good evening, happy Sabbath, and uh, welcome to the penultimate lesson for this quarter. Lesson number 12, and what a powerful series of lessons we have received during this quarter. Not just lessons for intellectual purposes, but to bring comfort, encouragement, um, especially in the world that we are living in today. Um, I would also like to welcome our panelists. You have been faithful for the 12 lessons, and we praise God for your contributions. Um, we also would like to thank the and welcome our viewers to this evening's um, lesson. We invite you also to, if you can see a comment section, whether it is on YouTube or Facebook, we have access to both platforms, so you are able to uh, assist us and help us in the lesson as we call this an open study. Everyone is invited to share a comment, and we will try our best if there are any questions to address them and speak to it. Our lesson for this week um, is entitled Dying Like a Seed. Dying Like a Seed. Um, but before we dive into the message, let us just close our eyes for word of prayer. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Nigel if you can open in prayer for us, please. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this week's lesson and for the quarter. And tonight, Lord, as we look at what it means to, to die, we pray that you'll give us wisdom. And may it be that we'll learn what you want us to learn from it. May we apply this and may we share this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. All right. So um, I do want to share a little bit of a testimony before we begin. Um, and it's, it's related to the, to the title. So I have just come from uh, Cape Gate Mall up in Brackenfell. I just had to do a few things there. And while we, I was doing my activities over that side, the siren went off and there was an alarm. And the announcement came out, uh, came you know, on the microphone for us to vacate the building, the, the Cape Gate. And, um, and you could actually see different groups of people. You know, you had the group of people that were just saying, we need to get out of here. They were pushing trolleys at one side, pushing, just trying to get out. Didn't care who's in front of them, who's behind them. They just wanted to get out of uh, the mall as soon as possible. And then you had, you know, those ones who were on the external, you know, looked brave. You know, they, they had the external expression of, I'm okay, but really deep inside, I'm one of them. You know, we were very frightened for our, for our lives and we were scared to die. And, um, and I noticed, you know, that, I, I mean, throughout my pastoral work, it doesn't matter. I've, I've come across many people that are on their deathbed. And I've, I have experienced many of us are afraid. Some way it's an innate feeling, you know, innate, it's a natural kind of tendency to be fearful of death. And I think one of the reasons why we become so fearful of, of dying is because, um, uh, because of the great unknown. Now, for Adventists, we know what happens when you die, you know, but yet there's still the unknown uh, that, that we are diving into. And, and, it's, and it's a scary thought. There's also the, what they call, you know, FOMO, um, fear of missing out. Some of us have, have that fear. So we, we, we are scared to die because really, we don't want to miss out. We don't want to see our children grow up without us. We want to see if they get graduate. We want to see who they get married to, you know. Um, and and so there's this great fear, and and it boils down to um, the fear of the unknown, not knowing what's going to happen to our family when when we are no longer alive. And that is why you have so many insurance companies, you know, coming and saying, well, we can we can give on your life insurance a million rand. Um, you don't get to spend it, but you at least have the, the comfort to know that your family gets to spend it at the end of, of your life. I don't know if that is good news or sad news, but they get to spend and, and get the profit of your life. And I want to believe that this idea of fearing the, the literal death is similar to that of the spiritual death. Um, we, there, there is this tendency of being fearful. To die spiritually, and I, I think it's the same fear that we have when we have to die um, physically, and that is the fear of we don't know, you know, the, 
the, the unknown. We don't know the future. We don't know if we put our trust in something else, what will come out of that. Because, because we live in a world where we like to have control. We like to be in charge, in, you know. And so to be able to die spiritually, we are basically saying, we now need to give up our independence. We are moving a transitioning from independence to self-dependence to a, a position of being dependent. And it's scary, you know, um, to put your trust in, 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 in someone, and especially someone that you have not physically seen yet. Um, but I believe that this is the Christian calling to sacrifice, to, 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 to step into the unknown when we go to Hebrews 11. You know, verse one, it speaks about faith uh, being the substance of and, and, and not being able to see. So it is a scary thought. But I believe that with this command that God gives, I mean, in Philippians uh, 2 verse 5, you know, let this mind be in you that, um, you know, having the mind of Christ becoming nothing. I think we have we have so many promises in God's word uh, that. When we do die to self, there's, there's so much promises and stories in the Bible of, you know, the assurance that we will come out better when we do uh, depend on, on God, when we do put our trust in God, even though we don't know what the future holds. So many stories in, this, in, this, in, in the Bible. I mean, when I think of the story of the rich young ruler and Christ comes to him and, and, and I mean, in fact, he comes to Christ and says, good master. And Christ says, well, no one is good, but 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 God. And, and then he he kneels down and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Christ then, you know, says, speaks about the commandments and this is a brief summary of the commandments. He says, Lord, this have I done. And then Christ says to him something I think Christ speaks, you know, would like to say to all of us or, or says to all of us, he says, uh, you know, sell everything you have. And I think the reason why Christ says to him, sell everything, because when you when you sell everything, you now become dependent. You move from a position of being self-dependent to being dependent. And this is, and Christ says, this is, this is eternal life. And um, even though it's a scary thought, I believe, and I'm coming back to it, that there are so many promises in the word of God that assures us when we take this risk of dying to self, that we are in fact able to, to come out big, like, I mean, uh, better. Christ says, you know, in, in Philippians 2 verse 5, the Bible says, Paul says, let this mind be in your Christ. Then it says, after Christ dies to the death, the Bible says, then verse 10 says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall, that he is Lord. So in our dying, you know, uh, Christ exalts us. He says, the Bible tells us in the book of Job chapter 3 and chapter 4, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's what we call the upside down kingdom, you know, becoming uh, dependent on God so that God can glorify us. And so I'm going to give over because we have quite a bit to cover. But um, I, I, like I was speaking to the panelists today, I, just, I was just finding a bit hard to, to fit this lesson into the greater scheme of things or the, the theme of crucibles. And I want to share this with you. So that you can actually tie, and I know Pastor Pochita will also share some a uh, his thought, but you can actually tie this lesson to the greater lesson, which is the crucibles uh, of the crucibles. And, and this is what I, I have here. So it says, so this is how you can fit it in. I believe God allows crucibles in our lives so that we can learn how to depend on Him more. And so this is what surrendering uh, is all about, you know, crucibles, God allows it so that we can realize our weakness, our failures, our in incapabilities, and realize that we need a greater hand, which is the hand of God on our lives. And so it is by allowing these crucibles in our lives that we actually get to a point where we can depend fully on God. Okay, I, I, I hope that makes sense, at least to the panelists. But let's go over to Sunday because we're going to learn, you know, how to get to this point where we can be completely dependent on God, even through our crucibles. And so let's go to Sunday's portion of the lesson. And I think that is going to be uh, led by um, my cousin, uh, Pastor Nigel Carolus. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Eugene. I uh, 
love this portion and I think I'm just going to read it so that uh, for those that might not have it because data must fall, you know it's expensive. So I'm just going to read it up here. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you. So the mind is the attitude, um, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, <clears throat> was God in all sense of the word, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, uh, meaning his existence, um, but made himself of no reputation. And so you have this picture of a balloon that's inflated, and then suddenly it's deflated. So void of all the splendor. Taking the form of a bondservant or a slave and coming in the likeness of men, like us. And being found in appearance as a man, <clears throat> pardon, he humbled himself. Um, and that humble is, is uh, you're emptying yourself. And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's a beautiful reflection there. That's actually a poem. Um, so if you ever wondered if Paul was a poet, uh, he was a poet. That was a beautiful poem. And, and the whole book of Philippians is actually centered around this poem. You'll, you'll see it in different sections of the letter itself. It's all focused around this poem. And uh, when you look at, at what Paul is trying to teach us, when I was thinking about dying like a seed, you know, Paul's whole tone, where is Paul at the moment? He's in prison, right? He's in prison. And so uh, a Roman prison was no picnic. And uh, he's there. But um, his attitude is like, it's not so bad. Um, if I die, I'm going to be present with the Lord. If I live, I get to start more uh, Christ-serving communities. So whatever happens, I'm okay. And so Paul doesn't even think that dying is a problem. For him, no matter what happens, everything will be okay. It will it'll work out to the advantage of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and he says, for me to love is, is Christ, and to die is, is gain. And so you've got this mind of Christ. Now, what does this have to do with, with the whole lesson? When you look at this uh, section, actually, um, this poem, this attitude of humility, nowhere do you find in this poem that Paul speaks about how we are saved. Right? There's nothing about atonement. This is purely his relationship with the Father, that he's willing to humble himself to the point of death and the cross. And because of that, he will be exalted. Nothing about how we are saved. It's just the humility of, of Christ. And so let me just start by saying that none of us can emulate the humility in terms of the position. None of us started as God. <laughs> so we can never truly understand just how much Christ descended. But the attitude that self-sacrifice, that is what we should emulate because that's our example. And so Paul invites us as the readers of, of Philippians to consider other people's needs and their interests. And you can see that from verse 1 to 4 where he actually shows us what is the mind of Christ? What does it look like? So if you go to the first verse, it, it actually tells you um, where Paul says um, you need to love one another. If there's any fellowship, um, affection and mercy. Um, have the same love, be united, have one mind. And uh, when you read further, verses 19 to 20, he actually tells you what it looks like when we actually sacrifice and, and are not selfish and we have the mind of Christ where we create these pockets of, of heaven wherever we go. And uh, this is what Paul is getting at. So we know that life is hard. Life is difficult. We've got our crucibles. Um, Sometimes it makes us complain. Um, otherwise, it makes us compete. Um, sometimes we want to hoard resources to meet our own needs. Paul says, remember, Jesus' selfless sacrifice, that leads to life. That his resurrection gives us a reason to, to humbly share with others in the most difficult times, most difficult crucibles. And so Paul says, these prison chains that I have, it proves that sharing Jesus' attitude isn't easy. It might even lead to death. 
but he encourages the church. And this was his first church that was started through the help of the Holy Spirit. And he reminds them that you need to endure for the sake of Christ. And so when you look at this whole section, you can actually compare Philippians 2 verse 5 and to 11 to Genesis chapter 3. Because Adam and Eve, they want to take advantage of the opportunity to be equal with God. But what happens? Death comes as a result. Jesus refuses to exploit his equality with God. And what was the result? He's exalted to the highest level. Highly exalted means that it's the highest level that you can get. It's what Revelation speaks to us about, that worthy, worthy is the Lamb. And then the last verse, verses 9 to 11, it's actually where Paul is quoting the Old Testament. He's going to Isaiah chapter 45. And, and Paul wants to tell us and tell his readers that the reason why I can be like this and have this attitude and, and be okay with any crucible is because the one who I'm doing it for, that was the Messiah. That was the Messiah that Isaiah spoke about 700 years ago. And then Paul encourages us in uh, verses 1 to 3 of chapter 2 and verses 12 to 16 of chapter 2 of Philippians, how we should emulate the attitude of Jesus. And then Paul also gives examples of, of people who emulate the example of Jesus. And, and that is the, the, the commendation that he gives for Timothy in the same chapter and, and Epro, Epaphroditus. And uh, he says, look at them. These are tangible examples. Uh, look at me. Remember that to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so when you read these, these, this, this poem, you understand what Paul is really trying to get at. That our life is a life of service. And it's not easy to serve. Could lead to death. But that's okay. Because we serve a living God. Amen. Amen. You know, I like, I like when you say that uh, Christ was elevated to the, to the, to the, to the, to the highest um, position. And, and, but the verse before that also says that he was, he was downgraded to the lowest position. To, you know, so he was, it was like at the lowest low because the Bible says not just died, but died to a cross. And when people died to the point of a cross, you know, they would go around. So there were various ways. There's some some background history with various ways of of how people who die. You know, some people who die by um, by the fire, and then when you die by a fire, a priest would come and the priest would then do a, a prayer for you in the hope that you, that you get to see life again after you die, or you when you are thrown to the lions, or whatever. Then the priest would come. But when someone hung on a cross, this is what I've I've read. They say that the priest wouldn't even come. You know, because the, in the priest's mind, once you hang on a cross, there was no hope for you. And so Christ died that kind of death, you know, went down, down, down. But now he's elevated. And I think that's a powerful example for us when we even become humble towards each other. You know, we live in a society where everyone's just living for themselves. They just, in their own, in their own uh, personal space, you know, but... When we live for others, that is when we appreciate joy. That's when you start for your life feels fulfilled. Um, that's that's the service of Christ. Thanks, Pastor. Anyone else would like to comment or share a, a quick thought on on Sunday's portion of the lesson? If not, then we'll just move on to to Monday's portion. If I see a hand, I'll take it. Going once. All right, all right. Says uh, Pastor Swartz, and then we'll go over to Monday's portion with Pastor Firstenberg. Yes, go ahead. Just a short one, Pastor. As Pastor Nigel was, you know, bringing out the lesson, something cropped in my mind that actually uh, this humility that the Lord is trying to bring out in us through the example of Christ is asking us to renounce our rights, the rights that we think we have, uh, so that we can fully rely on him. And this took me back to to Adam and Eve before sin, for instance, who were gathered together, made uh, from earth, from the soil. And that soil depended on God to keep together and not crumble. 
So that, that was a form of humility. And they were intentional also in looking forward in being in the presence of the Lord. They depended fully even then. And how much more for us now? Thank you. Amen. Amen. Pastor Furstenberg, I think you are ready for Monday's portion of the lesson. Another aspect of how we can actually become dependent on God. Thank you, Pastor Carolus, and good evening to everybody. Um, I, th I think just to to uh, to connect the two with each other, um, I would like to go back to our memory text just to quickly read that uh, John 12, verse 24, and it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Now, if we if, if we use that as a springboard, um, we can see that there's there's uh, uh, we we have started to talk on this lesson with with uh, that dying that dying of self um, and uh, Monday's portion the the heading there is dying comes before knowing God's will so it's 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 like that seed that falls into the ground when it falls he doesn't know what's going to happen next um, and 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 all of a sudden it's under the ground and it's dark and sometimes it becomes wet and you don't know what's going to happen but the dying needs to take place before the new plant can start growing and that is exactly what is happening with us um, spiritually or should happen with us spiritually i've written down here the fundamental principle for us to know god's will because that is what it's about here is to die to self so put everything of self away and then start with what is God's will for my life. But you have to die of everything. Now, Now that is a difficult thing because it, we, we don't know what is the dying. We don't know how to die. But that is to set everything aside, to set my will aside for everybody else. And uh, the author says there um, on Monday's portion, it says, Many Christians sincerely seek to know God's will for their lives. Now, I think all of us wants to know what is God's will for our lives. And then there's a quote that says, if only I could know God's will for my life, I will sacrifice everything for him. Now, that is what we are all saying. If I just know, I will sacrifice. We, we don't say I will sacrifice and then I will know because that's just not the human thing to do. We don't want to sacrifice first because maybe it will be in vain maybe nothing will come of it if i sacrifice first but um uh, even after promising god this now, now this is what the author is saying here we still may be confused about his will for our lives and then it takes us to romans 12 uh, verses 1 and 2 and i'm reading from the nasb and it says therefore i urge you brethren by the mercies of God, so the grace of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, other translations would say, which is your acceptable worship. And then verse 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. So there comes the will of God. First, you have to trust on the mercies of God, that, that what he has done for you is enough. So his sacrifice on the cross was enough for you. If you accept that and you give everything over to him, that is the first thing that you must do. And then he says, don't worry about what the world is saying. Don't be confronted to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So don't think like the world thinks. Now you must start thinking in a spiritual manner. And, and then it says, so that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, out of those verses, we, uh, we, we learn three things. And that is what the author brings out. There. He says, firstly, we have true understanding of God's mercies. That's the first thing that we need to know. We have to understand 
the goodness of God and what he has done for us. As soon as we understand that, you know, we, we, we as Christians, sometimes we just talk, yes, Christ died on the cross for your sins and, and he does nothing to you. You know, it's, it's just another saying. It, it doesn't transform you. It doesn't make you think that somebody actually died so that I can live. So that's the first thing that we must do. We must realize and understand God's mercies of what he has done. Like Pastor Nigel has said to us in Sunday's part, we must understand what he has done. Secondly, um, we must offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. Now, now I, I, I find this sometimes, uh, I shouldn't say interesting, but people say, I will die for my faith. I will go through the fire for my faith. And then normally I ask and then, then I say, so why don't you just live for God right now? Because that is actually what he wants. He doesn't want you to, to physically die. He wants you to die to the world and how the world is thinking and change so that your life can be a living sacrifice. Now, now sacrifice, um, I like the Afrikaans word, you know, there's an offer. It, it, it means you have to sacrifice something. And, and to sacrifice something is, is to give up something which you like. Now, that is where we come from, from the world. And as soon as we give up what we like and we accept what God has planned for us and that he wants certain things for us, then all of a sudden our minds will be transformed and renewed. And as soon as that happens, it is much easier to understand what's God, what God's will is for your life. I'm, I'm reading there in, um, in the uh, lesson study it says it is only the renewed mind that truly can understand god's will but this renewal hinges on our death to self first so this is the first thing we first have to sacrifice that and die and then we will understand uh, what's god god's will is for our lives it is not enough that christ simply suffered for us that's what it says there in the lesson study he had to die so he had to lay down something so that we can have salvation. So we also need to lay down this world and the thinking of this world so that we can understand God's will for um, our lives. Then I quickly just want to take us to, to Titus, um, Titus 3 and um, verses 3 to 7. And, and here Paul is also uh, talking about the mercies and it says there for we also once were foolish ourselves disobedient now this is how we were deceived enslaved to various lusts and pleasures spending our lives in malice and envy hateful hating one another but when the kindness now that's the mercies right of god our savior and his love for mankind appeared to us so we understood it he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in the righteousness, but according to his mercy. So he has saved us first. And then he says, transform your life. He doesn't wait for you to transform your life. And then he saves you. And then he goes on and it says, uh, by the washing of the regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So we follow what Pastor Nigel was uh, referring to that, Christ did everything and he gave an example for us. And that is what we must emulate. So being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then we, we first need to understand in, in this lesson of this day that there are some things in our lives. You being an Adventist, a saved Christian for doesn't matter how many years, there is still things in our lives that we need to sacrifice and that we need to die of. Maybe it's for me um, being too much online, even while I'm in bed. Maybe it is something else. We need to sacrifice that so that we can be more in line with God. So die off first, and then we will understand God's uh, will in our lives. Thank you, Pastor Carolus. Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, nicely put. 
Um, just on 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 Mondays, is there anyone else who'd like to just jump in there quickly and give a thought? If not, we are we are making we are making progress. We are going to go to to Tuesday's portion. Uh, but I, I want to just on what you read, you know, uh, one of the um, viewers um, made reference to Galatians chapter two verse twenty. I think it was Natasha, and I think it's it's a nice. It's a nice, it's a nice verse. One of the verses that you know we should really, probably the gospel. One of the gospels that we should really uh, implant on our minds and our in our hearts. It says, Paul says, so "I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me." Now let's just move over to 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 Monday's uh, Tuesday's portion, and I think uh, we 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 are dealing with uh, the willingness to listen, and um, you know it speaks about the story of Eli and and Samuel. Now Eli was was the priest at Shiloh, and and he had two sons. Called Hophni and Phineas, um, terrible sons. You know, I, I, when I ever speak or preach on, 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 on these two sons, I always see them as rowdy ones. Ones making a lot of noise. You know, running around uh, when they were growing up, and then um, being bad influence. Because remember, at this stage, Samuel is living in the temple, and so he's got growing up with this rowdiness. He grows up with this peer pressure, but yet in the midst of all this noise. Samuel finds it, um, he find, he's able to still hear the voice of God. He's able to still to discern the voice of, of God. And um, I mean, in our crucibles, in our, in our lives, uh, I think one of the things how we can always depend on God is always to depend on his word. But when the word of God is difficult to find, then... Um, we need to find it difficult to depend on God's word. I hope that makes sense. So I want to pose a question quickly to the panelists. As I just quickly summarized uh, Tuesday's portion is how can we ensure that um, we are always in tune with the voice of God, even amidst the crucibles, amidst the noises, like where Samuel found himself in. I mean, he audibly heard the voice of God three times as if it was Eli calling him and he goes to Eli, have you called me three times? And then Eli said, no, no, surely it must be God. And then we hear God's voice again, say, you are Lord. Yeah, I am your servant. Here. So how can we, panelists, get ready to answer this question? How can we get to a point where we can really distinctly hear God's voice in the midst of the world's noises and peer pressures and the crucibles that we find ourselves in? Not all at once. And I see well, you all jumping. On my... Yes, Pastor Candy. <laughs> uh, this is what I, I saw as God's effort to take us back to where we were before sin. You know, um, and we were in communion, lived in communion uh, with God utterly. They did not hear any other voice. They did not know anyone else except God. He is the one that was the electricity in their lives. That was the power. They were able to go on. They were able to laugh and be happy. They were able to do everything that a, 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 an enabled human then was able to do. Today we have death, we have, death, we have sicknesses, we have... Um, you know, all kinds of crucibles that should not have been there had we the ear to listen to God. And I, 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 want, I want to believe if we could, you know, be quiet and allow God to speak so much to us that everything or every other voice is dead around us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I see Natasha is saying by listening, but that's a question I'm actually posing is how do you open yourself? How do you, how are you always in tune to the voice of God? But, but Peter, 
answer. Yes, thank you very much. So I don't know whether I'll necessarily give the answer. I think it is um, uh, simple to say, you know, listen to God and um, be willing to listen. But I, I wonder if the key is not in there. Um, because, you know, uh, today in conversation, often we listen to give an answer or we listen to defend ourselves. So when people talk to us, we don't really listen to the message. We don't really listen to what the person is saying. So, so when people speak, uh, we start making notes and uh, formulate an answer and, 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 and the response. And in that, the message actually goes away. We often find this um, in relationships uh, where um, we don't really listen to our spouses or our significant others when um, uh, they, they, they want to convey a message. We, we, we too focused and too absorbed in trying to respond or give an answer. And I wonder if the same attitude or the same obstacle is not interfering between us and God. So that instead of listening to God um, by portraying this willingness to hear God's voice, we are actually trying to answer God. You know, we are actually trying to respond um, instead of, uh, and Pastor Candy, I think you've uh, alluded to that, uh, is to become quiet. Um, we also um, looked at the other crucibles. Uh, one of them is, is patience uh, and, and, and to wait. You know, but in our anxiousness, um, in our wanting to have an answer now, uh, uh, sometimes we don't wait patiently enough. We don't become quiet enough uh, and we don't uh, listen because of our eagerness to respond instead of to listen. I, I thought I'll just throw that in. Maybe that will help us in um, really becoming quiet. And, and, and drowning, as it were, in God's word so that we can hear uh, his voice and not just the sounds and, and the noise, uh, as it were. God doesn't make a noise, but I, I'm just saying, so when there are sounds, you know, so that we don't just hear that, but that we actually hear the message and the heart of God. And that's what we should be listening to. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Pastor. You know, uh, Ro Romans chapter, and I like that because... What, what are we supposed to be listening to? Because, you know, I, I, if I'm going through a crucible, just make an example, I'm going through a crucible and I'm saying, Lord, or I'm, I have to make a decision in my life. I say, Lord, I'm going to depend upon you. Speak to me now. How is God going to speak to me? And, and you've, you've alluded to that um, by, by, by his word. Because if you go to, to, to Romans 10 verse 17, it says, so faith cometh. Now faith, we know what faith is, right? It's to be able to, to, to get to the unknown, to depend upon God. So it says, so, so faith, uh, so verse 17 says, so faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. And I think, you know, um, if we, because we can't just sit back and say, Lord, you speak now. I think we need to constantly find ourselves in the word of God because before we even will ask God, the Bible says, if we find ourselves in the word of God, God, we already have the answer from the word. Like sometimes we ask God for, for questions, uh, answer. But if we have been studying the word of God, God says, I've already answered you because you've studied. You know, just a simple example. When we have to people, you know, someone came to me and said, Pastor, I'm praying for the Lord, you know, for me. Um, and, uh, uh, asking the Lord if this girlfriend is 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 the right one for me. But already there's clear indication as to, you know, uh, the Bible makes it clear, speaks about unequally yoked and all these things. Uh, we come and we still say, God, you speak to me now because this girl, I know she's unequally yoked, but speak to me. But God has already answered us. But so the more, I believe, the more we find ourselves in the word of God, the more that verse where it says, when we knock, before we knock, the doors will be open. You know, before we ask, it will already be answered because we've already found ourselves entrenched in the word of God, like the word you said is drowned in the word of God. So God speaks to us, not in a, in a vacuum. It's not just one of these days, uh, you know, ask God a question and automatically we expect God to audibly speak to us. This is where he speaks to us through his word. And when we listen to his word and drown ourselves, I believe that we will find 
the answers that we need. Um, if there's nothing further on Tuesday, I think we've got an idea of how it was possible for Samuel to be able to hear God's voice even in the midst of all the noises that he found himself in. And that is one of the things is to, to remain uh, in the presence of God, remain constantly uh, under his word. Uh, let's go to, uh, where are we? Um, Wednesday. Pastor Swartz. Oh, okay. Pastor, Pastor Peter has something to add, and then we go to uh, Wednesday, Pastor Swartz. Yes, maybe just a quick one, you know, when you were talking there about the noises, you know, I don't know whether it comes with the season into which I'm moving now. I don't want to say age because um, I still feel very young at heart. But one of the things that I started uh, noticing that is if I find myself in a room where there's lots of um, things going on, um, background noises and people talking, that I struggle to hear. Uh, and to 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 distinct one of the uh, um, um, sounds or the or the voice that I want to listen at. So if there's a group of people talking and I want to listen and follow the conversation, it becomes more and more difficult. They say it has to do with age, but I wonder if the same thing doesn't happen with with, with God. That there are so many other noises. Uh, I think um, you referred to screen time earlier as a pastor Furstenberg. Um, you know, so many distractions and obstacles. That, that it becomes almost impossible to hear uh, the voice of God and recognize the voice unless we deliberately, as Jesus did early in the morning, make sure that it is quiet around us, um, that, that uh, we, we rest, we sacrifice uh, those things that you've said, Pastor Furstenberg, so, so, so that uh, the, the, the background noises is, can be as um, little as possible so that we can clearly uh, hear uh, God's voice. Amen. What does John chapter 10 verse 27 say? You know, it says, uh, my sheep hear my voice. You know, they hear his voice. They can discern his voice um, even in the midst of other noises. Yes, thank you, Pastor. Let's go over to Pastor Candy. Please share with us Wednesday's portion of the lesson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wednesday's is sub uh, titled Self-Reliance self-reliance under dying like a seed and uh, you know it made me think how important it is that we should be grateful for crucibles as king saul whom we find to be the major example uh, or illustration we are finding under wednesday he also had a fair share of such crucibles not to bring him down not to deface him, not to, you know, disadvantage him or anything like that, but to build him and make him a better person. For instance, we discover in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, he is called and anointed to kingship, and he's going to be the first king. And same chapter 10, verse 8, God gives him his commands, his commandments through the prophet um, uh, Samuel. He tells him to go ahead of him to Gilgal and wait there for seven days. And thereafter, him, Samuel, will come and, and, and uh, sacrifice. Uh, lo and behold, seven days pass and uh, 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 King Saul, uh, you know, start becoming fidgety and you know, he, he he ultimately, you know, does things he was not supposed to do. So the major thing here is that he, he, he first trusted in himself when things did not go according to how he thought they should be. That is, he started listening to the many voices uh, which quieted the voice of God, the commands he had received from um, uh, the prophet uh, Samuel. And so he started trusting upon himself and not on God's commands. And he also lived by I, I, I. And I remembered the five eyes that um, Lucifer brought up in heaven, as we read it in, 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 in Isaiah 14, verse 13. I will ascend. I will do this, I will do this. And so this kind of eye was pushed up 
uh, in, in, in Saul, King Saul's mind such that it paved the way for him to self-rely. You know, he, he turned to self-reliance. And, 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 you know, all this, as he was interacting with self and uh, finding that uh, self was overcoming him better than him, you know, overcoming self. Remember what the Lord told um, uh, Cain as he was angry against his brother Abel. He told him, sin is crouching at your door and you need to stand up like a man and fight it. But then uh, Saul was overcome by, by, by sin. And this is how he was hindered uh, in his growth to a better self. He first saw, and after seeing, he said, and after saying, he, he felt, you know, if we read it directly from the verses, First Samuel chapter 13, verses 12 and 13, it says, Saul said, when I saw that the people are scattered from me, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a bent offering. I, 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 you know, three steps that led him to a downward uh, spiral. He first observed and, and weighed things in his mind rather than relying on the commands of the Lord that were, you know, brought out to guide him. And then he started assessing, that is putting things on his own scale. Uh, rather than, you know, trusting God for his word, he started using his own scale to see if really he can trust God or he must, you know, find other options. And then he acted. He acted uh, thus trying to improve God's plan. He thus tried to improve God's plan by acting. And, you know, these steps were all based on fear. Uh, King Saul was fearful. He did not want to be seen as a failure uh, by those that he led. Uh, instead of letting himself be led by God so that he can lead his people better, he started relying on himself and that all brought trouble upon him. And of course, we get the illustration of Eve who also decided to rely on herself than on the word of the Lord, you, you see? And that all uh, tend to become a terrible consequence upon not just her life and all of our lives, only through self-reliance, relying upon oneself instead of... And, and dash. Of, 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 of of God, that is. And so these are, these are the lessons that we ought to glean from, from this lesson. Christ is our safety. Like the true vine, we cannot for a moment, you know, bring ourselves apart from, detach ourselves from. For us to leave, the branch is, it's important for the branch to always be connected to the vine for therefrom comes its food for it to, to, to allow it to grow and prosper. So if, if we start self-relying, then that is our demise. I think I will let it there. I will stop there. No, thank you so, so much, uh, uh, Pastor, Pastor Swartz. You know what else would like to comment on, on, on that portion of the lesson? We are my my electricity is 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 is, is going off at eight. And so we have ten minutes uh past the post heater to, to to hit us with a bang uh as we end this this lesson. So help us with Thursday's portion and um 
let's see if we can if we can find um, uh, a few uh, brief comments after that from from the panelists. But but let's go over to Thursday's portion of the lesson. Thank you uh, very much, Pastor. I wonder if you don't just want to respond to this question, a comment that we've received um, about um, Pastor Guala that uh, is not with us tonight. Um, okay. I don't know, Pastor. Yes, yes please uh, t t tell our, <laughs> our audience. We we are so happy for for these kind of comments. You know, when when people become attached to to certain panelists, and that, this is beautiful. This is beautiful to see. So, Pastor, Pastor. Uh, Pastor Guala is can't be with us because he's sick. You know, there's a little bit of a virus going around, um, and it's causing people to get sick for about two weeks. So I think Pastor Guala caught this virus, but I'm sure he'll be with us next week, next week for sure. But thank you, thank you so much for for that comment and concern. You'll join us. Thank you, Pastor. I think I've answered that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, as you say, time is running and the load shedding is coming up. And um, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the discussion and the um, beautiful thoughts that has been expressed this far. Uh, I, I see many um, things in the lesson very differently from the way that I studied as I listened to uh, my colleagues um, explaining and expanding on these thoughts. So, so um, you know, with a focus or the theme then of, of substitutes, um, going um, from from self-reliance now to to what do we do when we rely on self uh, i remember somewhere in in management and strategic uh, planning courses uh, uh, there, there's something called porters forces market forces and uh, one of the forces in the market is when there's a substitute product and, and it almost looks like um, we find a substitute for our faith here um, when, when the author was uh, uh, speaking. And um, I, I was um, interested to see that he said sometimes when we're in trouble, instead of relying on God, we rely on ourselves. Uh, and, and then he listed sort of there in the middle of the page, 101, he, he listed three uh, um, substitutes that he thought were substitutes. Now, I don't know, maybe the other panelists will, will correct me or reprimand me, but um, as I considered them, I thought that the first one, uh, when we use human logic or past experience, um, that would be a substitute then to depend on God. But I was not convinced that when we block our problems from our minds, when we need... Um, divine solutions, that that's necessary a, a, a substitute. Or the same with when we escape reality and avoid God, uh, when we need communication with, with Him. Um, that, that seemed to be, for me at least, more a consequence when we applied uh, substitutes. And so I thought, well, maybe, maybe I, I must just think a little bit about some of these substitutes, because very often, uh, instead of focusing, trusting on the divine, uh, the great I am, what we do is we rely on self. And that was what the, the previous day's lesson was all about. And thank you, Pastor Candy, for taking us through that. And so it seems that a substitute could be myself. I, I, I can substitute God with my ability. Or I, uh, I could uh, substitute, as the author of the lesson suggested, um, with um, my logic or my, my ability to reason or my lack of ability to reason or uh, even my experience. So, so often we've heard in church board um, or other church meetings when there's sort of a, a controversial point that somebody will jump up and say, you know, uh, in the 30 years that I've been the elder or the this or the that, you know, and, and, and so they, 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 they depend on experience rather than to depend on God. And so that would be a substitute. And so sometimes qualifications, you know, we, we quickly want to um, fetch our diplomas and just remind people that, uh, you know, I've got this and this and this degree uh, as if uh, uh, that would help me solve the problem. And uh, so I substitute God uh, with, my, with my qualifications. Uh, we could do that with status. Uh, the social status that I have or that I enjoy or that I think I enjoy could be a substitute. Uh, my performance, um, 
you know, I could look at how well I do things. Uh, I think that would be very close to, to, to ability. Uh, my position uh, that, I, that I enjoy, uh, it's not necessarily the same as, 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 as the status and my reputation, but maybe I hold a very specific position. Uh, maybe I should not mention elder again and, and mention another position in the church. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, so when there's a trouble and, and, and instead of depending on God, uh, um, I, I, I rather uh, depend on the position that I'm uh, in currently at that, at that moment or power. Uh, sometimes we have these power plays um, or sometimes we can substitute dependence on God with a bank balance or... Um, you know, when, when there's a lot of pain, sometimes we substitute God with things like substance abuse or, or behaviors that are very toxic and um, uh, destructive for us. Um, sometimes we can substitute um, uh, trusting and depending on God with entertainment uh, to fill that void. And so, so those things seems to me would be uh, substitutes for, for uh, relying on. Uh, uh, on myself instead of relying on God. So I'm substituting God with these various things uh, um, and I, I place my confidence and almost my trust in those things. So um, that was just a brief um, take on it. So I thought that the first um, uh, um, item that the author of the lesson uh, highlighted was a substitute, as we discussed. But in my mind, uh, number two and number three were more consequences when we substitute God uh, with other other things, as we've talked about. And and then maybe uh, just briefly uh, and, and and wrapping it up, um, I, I couldn't help but just focus uh, on on uh, Zechariah four verse six. And again, mm -hmm. the question: you know, how how do we hear God? Uh, how do we die to self? How do we respond? And, and uh, um, the lesson there speaks about the background, you know, the challenges they had um, with, with building or rebuilding the, the city wall and, 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 and the opposition and the challenges they have. We don't have to look at that. But then, then the response, uh, and uh, let me read, read it to you. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. In, uh, and I think what he's saying to him is not by substitutes. So whether that substitute is my power, whether it is status, whether it's a bank balance, whether it's qualifications, none of those things would help. You need my sweet spirit. You need the very presence of God. And that alone will carry you through uh, crucibles. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Yes, and, and another substitute, uh, just to add, you know, can, can sometimes to, to focus or, or substitute God with the things of God. And so we sometimes, you know, focus on doing things for God, and we think now we can substitute that for actually God himself. But uh, there, there is a difference, you know. Um, uh, yeah, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. I... I want to come uh, the the same brother that 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 uh, was hoping Professor Guala would be here is saying all of you pastors you make a great team and so he's just encouraging us as well <laughs> so we thank you for that and then a comment here from Tina Kusnell she says it is it is imperative that we are nothing to learn it is imperative that we learn that we are nothing without the Lord. He is our refuge and our comfort at all times. We need to rely on the Lord at all times. And the verse that you've said, not by might, not by our might, not by our power, but by his spirit alone. And Paul continues to say, you know, he says, in our weakness, God becomes strong. And he says, that is why I boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Yes, not by our strength only by God and it's the only way we can get through these crucibles if we completely rely upon the Lord. Thank you so much panelists. Thank you so much viewers. Thank you for your comments. Thank you that you have joined us and we do pray that you know take a few if there were a few gems that you found here please there's no copyright share it with your class and um, and bring it back to us next week. Next week we will be dealing with the last uh, lesson for this quarter so we hope to see you yeah same time same place obviously load shedding 
uh, if load shedding plays with us. We're going to close in prayer. Um, Pastor Candy, can you close for us in prayer, please? Let us pray. Our loving and gracious Father, we wish to thank you for the lessons that make the Bible clearer in our minds. And may we all be helped by participating so that we can become better servers, um, better servants, and better Christians tomorrow. Bless each one of us as we prepare to lay down, to rest and prepare for tomorrow morning. And we thank you all in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. God bless. See you next week. Happy Sabbath.